Welcome to another Learn webinar. Today we are going to explore the outdoor education, a rapidly expanding approach. Today we're really thrilled to have Professor Jean-Philippe Ayotte Audet um, from the University of Sherbrooke. Um, he is a preschool and elementary uh, professor um, and he also is the research chair for outdoor education. Recently he published um, his research findings on outdoor education here in Quebec um, and he's here to share you know the benefits of outdoor education how it applies to our program here in Quebec um, and tons of other cool information um, about why we should take our kids outside I hope you enjoy it. so thank you very much Chris and uh, hi everyone it's a real ple pleasure for me to be uh, with you and uh, also it's my first time in the uh, English community here presenting. So I'm very glad to be there to talk about uh, outdoor education. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about outdoor education in the school context, but I think that we're going to, I don't know what's your background, but if you are uh, not from the school system or in other uh, areas, I think that the presentation will be uh, interesting for most of you. You can have some. Uh, interesting stuff in the presentation. So uh, outdoor education, a rapidly expanding approach. Why uh, are we saying a rapidly expanding approach? We've seen uh, in a survey in the province of Quebec that since COVID-19, uh, there's a lot more uh, of practices in the province of Quebec, especially. Uh, we knew that there was a lot of isolated practices before COVID-19, but we have seen with all the sanitary measures and uh, uh, also also growing interest about uh, nature-based uh, learning and stuff like that, that there's more and more teachers who are using uh, outdoor education. And uh, just to tell you a little bit, a little word ab about uh, who I am. So uh, like you told, I'm the research, uh, I'm the chair holder of the research chair in outdoor education at the University de Sherbrooke. And uh, we are a, a big team of uh, researchers and also uh, undergrad students, uh, graduate students. And uh, we are conducting a lot of research in different areas about uh, cognitive benefits, about uh, learning and uh, uh, physical education, health. And we're trying to, to see what's happening in the school context uh, globally. So I think it's important to, to know because there's a lot of people who are saying to us since the, the chair has been launched two years ago that it's great to have a research chair because some teachers were not necessarily recognized in their practices. It was more uh, recognized as something that is uh, for fun or just to go play outdoors. But uh, many people are, uh, a lot of people are telling us that it's great because now they have more credibility just because there is a research chair. So uh, if you want to Google us, uh, Sherbrooke University and the research chair in outdoor education, you will find us. So today uh, we're going to talk about concrete stuff. Well, I'll let you judge, but I hope it will be concrete for you. I will just tell you what's school-based outdoor education uh what do i put in just to make sure we are talking we're talking about the same thing i will also talk about the benefits uh, recognized in the scientific literature i will not uh talk a lot about research during the presentation but mostly here because i think it's important to recognize where we are in that field um what is known because there's a lot of things that are also uh, now in the field that, that we need to, to acknowledge. And uh, for practitioners who are interested in outdoor education, if you don't know where to start, we're going to talk about that. I will give you some ideas of uh, learning situations, ideas. I don't know how you translate it correctly, but maybe activities. And uh, I want to present you also some inspiring schools, uh, elementary and high schools that are uh, to me inspiring and maybe I will have time to just give you more words about the research chair but uh, we'll have time for for a que question so 
just feel free uh, to to keep some question ask them and uh, hope we'll have time for that so it's good for you you still uh, stay stay with me okay <laughs> So what school based outdoor education? I think it's important to uh to tell you what we put in because outdoor education, we are we often have the vision of going uh in the mountains and doing some hikings and uh, stuff like that. So when we talk about school based outdoor education in the research chair, we really talk about doing some activities that are related to school but in the school's immediate surrounding. And uh, it can be associated to many uh, expressions. And I think that outdoor education, it's hard to really define it. But for me, it's an umbrella expression integrating several approaches and practices. Maybe you are doing some stuff like in this and maybe you are not, but there's a lot of uh, different approaches and practices you can uh, put uh, in this nature-based learning uh, but nature-based learning is not the only way to do some outdoor education. You can do outdoor education in the city, in an alley and stuff like that. Uh, we can also think about land-based learning. Uh, there's also the trend of forest school. Uh, we think about uh, experiential learning, environmental education, outdoor classrooms also that are more and more popular. Uh, but you don't need an outdoor classroom also to do outdoor education, but all these expressions are related in some way uh, to outdoor education. So it's always good to have a definition to help us to understand what we're talking about. So I, cho uh, I chose this one. We can define school-based outdoor education. It can be broadly, uh, it can broadly be defined as relocating standard curriculum teaching to places outside the buildings and walls of the schools as a supplement to indoor classroom teaching. So for me, it's not a way to say we should always be outdoors. It's it always depends on the intentions and what you want to do. But it's uh, outdoor education is another uh, approach that you can use to enhance your teaching or students learning, no matter uh, what you want to do with them. So what are the benefits of outdoor education? I think that there are five main dimensions uh, in the scientific literature that we should talk. The first one, they are not appearing in order of importance, uh, but I think that there's a lot of people who are going outdoors because of the eco-citizen dimension. What we know is that uh, developing an emotional connection with nature is a powerful predictor of respect for nature. So a lot of teachers are going outdoors to help students to make a connection uh, with, uh, with nature. And what we are seeing is that we want uh, kids to respect nature, to have uh, maybe to act for environment. Uh, we talk a lot about obviously climate changes, but it's good to speak about the problems. But if we don't develop an emotional connection that is positive, uh, it's hard to help students to, to act. And what we see in the research is that an emotional connection is not only a powerful, but it's the more it's the most important predictor of respect for nature. And I just want to tell you that the studies that you see uh, that we use as references, they are not only random studies; they are synthesis of literature. So uh, I will give you the the references if you want to see them, but it's a uh, it's a synthesis of many studies, so it's not only anecdotal results. Uh, what we also know is that having a positive attitude towards the environment uh, can foster the acquisition of environmental knowledge. So we, we want students to learn about environment, but uh, to work on their attitude towards environment, it can help also. And uh, like I told you uh, just a little bit before, being in direct contact with nature, it also helps to protect the environment. So I think it's important to understand that 
at school, it's good to speak about the problems, but if you only speak about the problems that are not concrete for students, uh, and if they don't build a positive relationship with nature, it will be hard for them to, to act and to feel that they have some power. So I think that it's the, the main thing to remember with uh, this dimension. Um, there's a lot of documented, documented benefits also on the cognitive dimension. So uh, first, brief contact with nature can have positive effects on learning and attention. And uh, when we look at the literature, what we see is that as, as little as 10 minutes, it can have a positive effect on attention. So here I told you that there are many uh, concepts or approaches related to outdoor education. Uh, I chose the word, uh, the word, uh, the words carefully here. So sometimes I use outdoor education, sometimes nature-based learning or contact with nature. Here it's not only to be outdoors, but to be in contact with nature or with living organisms. Uh, it has a, a positive effect on attention and it's not only for kids, it's also good for adults. So um, you can use it for yourself too. Um, Nature-based learning can improve intention, learning intention. So that's uh, really clear also. Um, what we also see is that it helps attention. So attention is related to learning. Uh, and outdoor education enables learning to be transferred to everyday life. We know that when we learn, the learning is uh, most of time specific to the context. So it will be uh, easier for someone to use his learning in a context that is similar to the context uh, where he learned, where, uh, where the learning occurs. So this is why also to me, it's important to, uh, to go outdoors with students because if we train them to be good for the assessments, the academic assessments, they may be good for this, but it doesn't uh, necessarily mean that they will be good to use their knowledge in everyday life situations when it's out of the academic context. So that's an important principle of learning too that is that can be applied outdoor. It's not only with outdoor education, but if we only uh, uh, train students to be good in, in academic situations and we don't help them to use their knowledge in the context that are not the ones that they will meet at school, uh, it will be a real issue for them. The, the third dimension with uh, documented benefits, it's about a uh, health dimension. So outdoor education reduces sedentary behavior and increases light physical activity. We have seen that clearly in our survey two years ago. Most of time uh, when kids are at school, they are, they, they are sit at the chair and they listen, or maybe they can be involved in something, but when they are outdoors, what we see is that students are most of the time uh, standing up or moving. And uh, what's bad is the sedentary behaviors, uh, like we are doing now, just <laughs> stay like this, uh, sitting. Uh, uh, just being uh, standing up, it's, it's, the, it's better, and moving is better. So we really we have seen that in our results uh, in our study. And uh, you can do whatever you want outdoors, and it's rare that students are just listening. So that's the first point to mention. Also, uh, outdoor education reduces perceived effort. So if students are doing an activity or something, we see that the perception of uh, effort is different indoors and outdoors. And finally, there's a lot of uh, variables where there are research uh, that are not really uh, necessarily related to uh, uh, to learning but for instance contact with nature lowers blood pressure and reduce uh, the risk reduces the risks of associated to myopia so i put these two examples not to uh, not because you won't go outdoors in the school context just because you want to reduce the, the risk associated to myopia but 
it's just to let you know that there's a lot of uh, also literature in the uh, in health uh, studies that uh, gives us good uh, reason to go outdoors. But I think related to myopia, I want to share you uh, this because what we are seeing is that the kids are having more and more problems with myopia because there's much more screen time uh, now. And uh, I'm a science high school teacher at first, <laughs> and uh, our eyes are muscles. And uh, if we don't uh, practice our eyes to look um, far, they will become more lazy. So this is one of the reasons also why there's more myopia uh, with kids today, because if you don't train your eyes to look far, uh, it will be, uh, they will become more lazy. So there's a lot of good reasons to have a mix of approaches at school, uh, also related to, to health and screens and what we are all experiencing. Uh, the the, the fourth one, so the uh, psychological dimension. So we see that nature-based learning reduces uh, anxiety-related symptoms. And uh, all these results, they are also good for adults, these ones. So take them for yourself too. <laughs> if you just go in nature, often you, you feel more relaxed. Uh, it's a physiological effect that is, that has a, that is also a related to psychological effects. Uh, we also see that nature-based learning increases well-being and uh, it can boost feelings of self-efficacy and self-esteem uh, with the kids. So uh, these are all interesting dimensions. I won't take too much time to talk about them, but just to let you, you, you pick whatever you want, but there's a lot of good reasons <laughs> to go outdoors. And the last one, uh, I think outdoors, if you have ever been outdoors with kids or students, you maybe you have experiences, you have experienced some differences in the the way the, the, the students are in relation with each other. And uh, also the, the students outdoors in their mind, they are not at school, like when they are raising their hand in the classroom so sometimes it changes their relationships and the way that that the kids will interact with each other so this is a part of the explanation why we see that uh, it's generally conducive to the development of social relationships between students and often we uh, see some students who are having some uh, issues with their behavior indoors and uh, they go outdoors and as a teacher, you say, oh, I don't want to go outdoors with, with this student because I will have some problem and uh, I will not be able to manage him. But there are always extreme cases, but most of the time, these students, they just need to move. They just need to mobilize their energy. And when they are outdoors, they can do that and they often become positive leaders. Uh, I give you an example of a student uh, I was in a, a classroom of uh, uh, second second grade and uh, there was a, a kid we were in the forest and I connected a lot with the kid and he was so proactive and uh, he was really brilliant the way he was uh, uh, he was doing what was asked by the teacher and after the, the teacher told me this kid when he's indoors I just cannot manage him. And outdoors, he was totally a leader with the with the colleagues. So I think that going outdoors also, we it's difficult, but it's important not to have preconceived idea of how the students will react. You need to to do some tests and to give you some time some time to uh, to see how they will uh, react. But uh, it can be surprising and. It's also a way to uh, ask us afterwards, what's the problem with school or the classroom if the kids are doing like that outdoors compared to when they are indoors? Um, so outdoor education also offers uh, additional uh, opportunities for collaboration because if you go outdoors, many funny situations, unexpected can occur. So sometimes it can also uh, strengthen the relationships between students and the teacher. Uh, 
And uh, finally, other education has the potential to increase equity. It can increase equi equity in many uh, ways. Um, what we see is that, especially with students with uh, a lower socioeconomic status, the, they don't the, these students, for many reasons, I really don't judge, but they uh, most of the time has less uh, experiences in the outdoors. Maybe they will have, uh, uh, it's great to go for a walk in nature in the mountain, but if you are living in the city and your parents, they don't have a car or something like that, you will have less chance to experience it. Or you live far from the park in the city in Montreal and you go to the, uh, to the supermarket and, uh, but that's your outdoor activities. So with socio lower socioeconomic status, uh, it has more power. And also uh, there are many variables, but more and more research are also conducted about equity. So there are more things to talk about uh, the different uh, dimensions that can have some benefits when you go outdoors, but I think that these five dimensions are important. If you see no benefits in these five dimensions, uh, maybe it's time for you to leave. Otherwise, you can stay with us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, obviously, if you want to uh, introduce some practices, outdoor education practices, you don't have to put this, uh, uh, you, you don't have to do this uh, all at the same time. And, it's not every uh, of these uh, dimensions that you can apply easily necessarily, and it takes some time, but uh, these, are, these benefits are well documented. So um, where to start? So that's the, I don't know where you are in your practices, if you're only interested, if you have al uh, already done some uh, outdoor activities. So. Uh, Feel free if you want to share in the chat <laughs> uh, what's your situation in, in one sentence or something like that. It will be great to help me to, uh, to have an overview of uh, who's in the, in the room. Uh, but I will give you some general advices. Maybe you can grab some of them if you, uh, if you want. So where, to, where to, to start? I think it's important to see outdoor education, not as something that is only uh, about the teacher. I think that outdoor education to be, uh, not to be implemented, I don't know the, the correct word because implement it's like top down, but I think that if you want outdoor education to grow in the schools, it's important to not to leave the teacher alone because there are some uh, challenges that he will experience if he's alone in the, with these practices. So. I think that the principal uh, is someone that has a, a great effect on what's going on. If your principal understands what you're doing, he can help you, help you to, to give you some, uh, some time to, to prepare some things with colleagues or to, uh, uh, to help you in, the, in your approach. Um, your co the colleagues also are important. It's important also to involve the students because uh, sometimes the students, they go outdoors and they are working, they are learning, but you have also to prepare them to, to, uh, to the outdoor activities, how to be dressed. And uh, also you need to maybe let them know that they are learning something, even if they don't think they are learning something. For instance, uh, my older kid last year, he was uh, going outdoors every day during a week to learn about uh about the chris help me les nuages i'm sorry the clouds thank you <laughs> about the clouds and he was trying to predict the weather and to identify the clouds and uh, he was really good at the end of the week and he was telling me oh yeah the sky today is like this and the clouds uh, these are the clouds but with these clouds there will be no rain and he was speaking like that and uh, but at the end of the day when he was talking to me about what they have done outdoors he told me yeah we didn't work uh, we were outdoors but uh, in his mind he was not working 
but it was really good to talk about the clouds. So you need also to uh, uh, to help students to be aware that they are learning also just to make sure that they don't tell to their parents that they are doing nothing, <laughs> that they are not working when they go outdoors because the parents can have the impression that they are not working. And uh, sometimes we see some issues with that parents that are uh, not sure if it's a good idea to go outdoors uh, or no, because we all know that in people's mind, learning at school, it should be boring. You should be listening. <laughs> if you are not bored and if you are not listening, you're not learning. I'm just kidding, obviously, but uh, you need to change this conception also. Sometimes the daycare service, they can be involved. The municipality also, they can be great um, people to work with because you can share some uh, installations or uh, uh, it can be free uh, free places when where you can go. Sometimes with the municipalities, you can uh, lend um, uh, uh, loan some uh, some stuff. So if you want to do uh, some sports, so it's important to have a broader view. Uh, after it's important to identify i think uh the intentions so why are you going outdoors you can have many intentions it can be to connect children to nature to use a meaningful context for learning increase students uh, physical activity promote students mental health and well-being there's much more but uh, i think it's important to identify the intentions because it will help you to speak with your your colleagues or the principal and explain what you are doing with the kids why you are doing that and uh, I think it's something to remember si since these practices are not uh, necessarily uh, uh, everywhere and it's not mandatory you have to explain what you do and to uh, uh, to help people to understand why you are going outdoors. So, and also when you go outdoors, it's not to do the same thing than you can do indoors. If you don't have any add value, um, there's no there's no point to go outdoors. So, it can be just to strengthen the, the relationships with the kids. Uh, it can be really various, but I think that it can help you to identify when to go and when to stay indoors. And uh, a lot of people think that they need a, a forest uh, or a woodland to go outdoors. But what we have seen in the in the survey that we have conducted two years ago is that a lot of uh, outdoor um, activities are occurring in the schoolyard. So you don't need to go out of the, the out of the school uh, limits. But you uh, always have a schoolyard. There's uh, in the city, you have most of the time a park that is uh, closed. You can have a woodland, a forest, uh, uh, the, uh, an alley also, if you're in Montreal. Um, sorry, there's two times uh, the park. So a waterfront, sport infrastructure, a garden, a meadow. Uh, you can just go into neighborhood streets. You will see some examples also uh, of what you can do. Uh, we don't always think about it, but an historic site or an historic infrastructure, you can also uh, have a look at the public art, uh, public art uh, in the city. So there's a lot of places that can be used. And uh, a good thing to do if you don't know where to go or if you are used to go outdoors and maybe you want to see if something else can be done, uh, you can use OpenStreetMap or Google Earth, Google Earth stuff like that, just to identify some new places maybe that you haven't think about. So everything is good, uh, Chris. Finally, many people wrote and I don't have time to, to read because uh, it's interesting, but uh, everything is good. <laughs> People have put in um, where they're from and kind of their background at door uh, education. Um, so lots of diversity we have here with us today. 
Um, and Martina, I got your question. We'll just we'll just wait till the end if if you don't mind. We'll wait till the end of uh, Jean Philippe's presentation. But yeah, it's going great. Thanks. Perfect. So uh, I want to give you some uh, ideas of what you can do because uh, it's easy to think about something to do in science or in physical education. You go, you, you do some sports uh, outdoors, but there's a lot of uh, simple stuff that you can do with kids. The, the examples here are mostly for elementary school, but if you are teaching in uh, at high school levels, you can easily uh, adapt these examples, I think so. So an easy thing, you can uh, look at the numbers in the neighborhood. So if you are in younger ages, uh, you can see look at the address and see, uh, oh, uh, are the address changing of uh, plus two or plus four every house? It can, can be something simple. Uh, if you are working on figures and solids, uh, go outdoors. There are figures and solids everywhere. Uh, if you just take a walk in, in your um, neighborhood and just start to look at the figures, the rectangles, the, the square, uh, the circle, and in the front of the houses, and you will see them everywhere. So sometimes we were speaking about uh, being more concrete with the kids, and I think that's an important added value of outdoor education. Um, it's to help to talk about concepts that may be abstract if you only talk about them indoors. But if you talk about figures and solids always on a, a sheet of paper, it's sometimes hard for students to, to visualize what's going on and stuff like that. But when you are studying it outdoors, you can see the difference because it's more concrete. And we know that abstract thinking, it's an issue for for students at a certain age, and it can stay a, a big issue for uh, many of them, even if they are uh, uh, getting uh, older. So uh, I think that uh, in mathematics, uh, it's pretty important to, to talk about that. You can uh, be calculating uh, surface areas, um, and uh, you can formulate statistical questions with uh, if you are with uh, younger, uh, older kids, for instance, uh, you can go on the street and uh, try to uh, to take some data about the color of the cars and the or the the frequency the frequency of the the cars at this time or this time of the of the day and do some uh, some problems uh, in maths with that also. Now. Um, in language, you can do a lot of stuff. Uh, you can practice new vocabulary. Uh, you can have a writing inspired by outdoor places. Sometimes you can just go outdoors and uh, uh, take some notes or just feel the place and come back indoors to, to have a, a writing that is uh, inspire, inspired by the places that you visit. Uh, you can do also a fun stuff. I don't know if you know uh, haiku. It's uh, short poems and it's really something fun to do if you go outdoors or you want to do something the first time and it's easy to do even with younger kids uh, you can do project-based writing uh, if you have also uh, a writing that you want to do and uh, address a letter to a mayor or to uh, the people who are living in a neighborhood so many projects can be really uh, based in the community um, and also i don't know where you're uh, teaching everyone, but uh, if you are teaching to elephant students, uh, I don't know if it's the same term in English. Yeah, it's the same concept. So with the kids who are not used to English, uh, what we have seen also in the research is that when they are in, uh, in the outdoors, it's like more an informal context for them. And uh, they maybe speak more freely outdoors than the uh, than indoors because indoors it's more formal and they may be shy to raise their hand compared to fluent speaking uh, students. Uh, in arts, uh, there's a lot of uh, ephemeral art projects. Uh, you can do some mandalas, you can do some uh, 
you can use photo to do some uh, uh, to do some arts. There's also public art, and uh, uh, I know that maybe you can Google it, but I know that there's a website uh, in the province with uh, that is a. Uh, uh, on the government of Quebec uh, website, and you can find every public art in the, all the cities uh, in the province of Quebec. So sometimes it's good also to discover just to know that oh, there's this uh, this in my city, and I didn't know. So that can be a different way to use uh, public art. And I gave you uh, the, uh, on this picture um, an idea that I find really great, especially because it's during the winter, but. Uh, on this picture, there is a kid, and uh, they put some some stuff in a uh, some some stuff in a. Uh, I don't know it. It was a circle thing, and they they put some leaves and the uh, stuff from nature. And like a like a pie plate, John. For the like yeah, a pie exact, plate. Yeah, exactly. And they just put a little bit of uh, water, and uh, they put it in the trees for winter just before christmas and uh, it's all natural so it can be a fun project uh, uh, during the winter because with ephemeral arts we we often see art we often see uh, uh, the leaves during the autumn but it can be uh, another idea of project so in science i will not spend too much time on that but you can talk about plant growth stages the weather conditions and clouds uh, the soil types, the ecosystems, obviously. And uh, finally, I think that uh, we don't use it enough, but also in elementary geography, uh, in geography, history, and citizenship education, you can talk about location in space, uh, continuity between past and the present. I give you a good example, but there was a teacher who was talking to me once, and uh, he was in a normal city not a big city at all but uh, there there was a bridge and uh he tried with the the, the students to find uh, why this bridge is there so what was going on in the society uh, 60 years ago when the bridge was built so it can be sometimes just a place that can be related to the past and it's more concrete for the for the students and you can ask oh before there's this bridge but before what was going on uh how does the citizen in the city were uh, uh, were going on the other side of the river for instance so sometimes it's just a way to relate to the reality and it gives more interest and uh, willingness to to learn for with students uh, you can talk about the territory's assets and constraints. Uh, so if you uh, talk about uh, uh, agriculture, you can maybe have some discussions. Uh, where was the agriculture? Why was the population close to the water course here? Uh, why there was some uh, agriculture in this part of the of the of the city? Uh, and you can also just use the influence of personalities there there are a lot of street names and there are there's a, a lot of uh, street names to relate to the past and there are some names that are really familiar to us because it's a street name but we don't know at all who this person is <laughs> so these are all some example easy examples that you can use in your surroundings to relate uh, learning to uh, geography history or citizenship education finally i want to uh, talk uh, about some inspiring schools to me uh, so the first one is a uh, tortue des bois elementary school it's uh, in a small village saint mathieu uh, du parc and it's an uh, uh, it's an alternative school and for a few years the school was closed and uh, some uh, families they they start an alternative school project and uh, based on outdoor education and uh, it's fantastic because there was no school for a few years in this uh, in this village and uh, finally there's this alternative school and uh, it helped the village to to bring back uh, some families in the village 
so the the school uh, was uh, was attracting enough to uh, to have some people to move so that's a, a great story um there is also uh if you just have a look there are some budgets sometimes to uh, uh to uh to change the the schoolyard so you see the la roque elementary school here in the uh, sherbrooke so the before and after it's not the same uh, the same view but it was really uh, a rent uh, like every random uh, school and after they did a lot of green spaces and you cannot see see it there but um it's not uh, there are some uh, the nivellation how you say it renovations um, different yes. elevations yeah like exactly small hills and stuff for yep. kids to, yeah for kids to move and uh, to develop their uh, their uh, their skills uh, so that that's a great place where there's a, a before and after. Um, there's also Jean Gauthier High School in Alma, uh, in the Lac Saint Jean. They have a program that is a wildlife resources program. It's really um, specific to their to their uh, area, but half of the school from secondary one to five are in this program, and they go. Uh, in the woods and they, they adapt their program to their reality and on the opposite there's a uh, la Dauversière high school in montreal uh, and they have a outdoor in the city program uh, it was originally created due to a lack of space in the gymnasium <laughs> and now uh, what's happening is that the gymnasium is sometimes free because the the program uh, is not really popular so i'm just showing you that to let you know that there's always something to do. It's not because you don't have a forest that you cannot do anything. You just need to 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 see what are the assets of my uh, school's immediate surroundings and what can I do with my kids. But there's always something uh, to focus on to develop some uh, practices. Um, so I think that What's important to uh, okay? So I think that what's important to remember is that outdoor education it's not mandatory, and uh, you don't have to do have to do outdoor education. But why people are going outdoors with students? It's mostly because they see some benefits for students and. Uh, uh, obviously, it takes some uh, energy, it takes time, and uh, you need to change practices. But if you're not used to do some outdoor education, and even if you are used to do some outdoor education, I invite you to be a researcher with your group and to see maybe uh, why should I go outdoors? When is there a value? When there is no value? Why do I do it? And uh, I think that when you become a researcher with your group, and you take some notes, observations. Uh, I think it's there that you can see why you should do outdoor education and when uh, there's a value and when there's less a value. So if you are uh, interested in knowing more about uh, what we are doing at the research chair, you can follow us, our activities. We have nothing to, to sell, <laughs> but uh, you can, uh, First, subscribe to our newsletter. Newsletter, it's uh, three times a week. If you go on our uh, web page, it's just by the end. We have also a Facebook, and uh, our web page is also uh, in English. So sometimes it takes more time to uh, uh, to add the information, but we uh, may also available our website in in English, and you will see um, many stuff. So um, our team publication, but also some useful resources what are our research projects. So just feel free to discover. I don't want to talk too much about that, but maybe if you want to do a master or doctoral uh, studies, uh, just feel free to contact us or just to attend to some activities that we are, uh, we are doing. Um, well, that's great. So that's it. So yeah, just to, to end it, I think that other education is 
a change in the paradigm of education. It's a way to question what we are doing in the school context. And uh, I suggest you maybe to think what you can do the next step, but obviously you cannot change all your practices, but I think it's interesting sometimes to see, okay, why should I do that? And what's the benefit for students? Well, this has been a great session. Um, I want to thank everybody that uh, held on here to the end. Um, Jean-Philippe, encore merci. Um, so much information again uh, that was really inspiring. And I really thank you for coming and joining our community and sharing uh, some of your research with us. So thank, thank you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure. And uh, if you just uh, Google my name, uh, Université de Sherbrooke, uh, Jean-Philippe Ayad Baudet, it's easy to find. So if you want to write to me, ask me a question or invite me in your school or anything, just feel free. Uh, I'm always glad to to read uh, uh, some people uh, from the different schools. It's great to to have you uh, to have you with uh, to to be with you and to uh, to see what's happening. So thank you very much.